Aerospace Systems, a changing paradigm and how you can help. First, let me quickly introduce you to our presenters from TALIS. We have Yannick Luray, Head of Pre-Sales and International Development for Cybersecurity Consulting and Operations. Uh, we also have Lawrence Rowell, who is the Director of Product Cybersecurity for our Connected Cabin and In-Flight Entertainment Systems. And finally, we have Natalie Fate, who's Chief Information and Product Security Officer for our Global Avionics Systems. The focus of today's session is to show how industry design attack learn and improve critical aerospace systems to cyber secure avionics, passenger systems, and air traffic management systems. First, we will speak to the changing requirements and what digital transformation has done for cybersecurity. Then we will explain our paradigm shift with respect to the dot design of our systems. And finally, we will talk about how we integrate good faith hacking and create a chain of trust. So let's start with Yannick to talk about digital transformation and cybersecurity. Yannick, over to you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, we wish we would be there physically. However, due to COVID-19, we're having this uh, virtual presentation. Hopefully, we'll be there all together next year for the next uh, uh, DEF CON. So now let's talk about digital transformation and cybersecurity. Uh, today, aviation sector is leading to digital transformation. This playground represents an international and complex ecosystem with a wide threat surface exposure for attackers. As you can see in this slide, uh, there are many targets to be protected. Uh, and some of them, we can talk about the air traffic control and air navigation systems. We can talk about the connected aircraft, the airport, the airline maintenance control center, as well as the UAVs and drones. These targets are associated with multiple risks and have second risk exposure. And therefore, we need to be coherent and with a global approach to better understand and reduce the risk. As I said previously, aeronautics environment is leading to digital transformation with an open and connected world. Digital transformation leads to data-driven organization and therefore cybersecurity. Knowing that, for aeronautics, safety is the first priority. We must secure stakeholders, uh, trust, as well as safety critical aeronautic system putting the passenger as our first priority. No digital transformation without trust, no trust without cybersecurity. This connected environment raises two challenges for aerospace ecosystem. First, safety and security stake requiring to keep up access in a safety environment, setting up cyber secure conditions across all system life cycle. And second, business continuity, needing to value cybersecurity to help prevent business operational disruptions. Now, let's talk about the hackers in these environments. We're going to talk about ethical, good faith hackers. And at this, we aim to provide the best possible practices. And we want to make sure our solutions and services, as well as our customers' infrastructures, are cyber secure. And would, therefore, we perform, for example, risk analysis and pen test using our own hackers. Sorry. And for sure, we're talking about ethical hackers and ethical talent hackers. These hackers can act through the internet. For example, from uh, one of our air na navigation service provider customer, uh, we've been able through uh, some services that we provided to them uh, through uh, a contract, we've been able to penetrate their uh, power generation systems. And this was uh, uh, able enabling us to go into their, uh, their server, which, which turned on and off the whole air traffic center. Uh, all this through our own facilities in France, going in their own uh, air traffic uh, control, where it was not for sure in France. Uh, and other uh, tools that we have are specific simulation environments. As you can see in this slide, we have the red team versus the, the blue team. With our simulation environments, we're able to implement the infrastructure of our customer, their operational infrastructure, where the red team is our own hackers, which mission is to, of course, attack and the vulnerabilities of the system, and the blue team is our co Our customers uh, in this uh, environment are there to be trained and 
see if they are cyber secure, also their system is cyber secure. More and more, we need ethical hackers able to master specific sector expertise. Uh, this sector expertise is very specific. We're not talking about only ISIT, we're talking about operational technologies. More and more, we're, uh, we're facing attackers who are, who are aiming at this type of uh, equipment and trying to, to be more and more uh, specific to where attacking. And I know the floor to Lawrence who will develop more on what we do in terms of avionics. Lawrence? Thanks, Shonik. Okay, so when we're talking about this changing paradigm, it's really important to understand the current and historical state of affairs. In other words, how has security been managed to this point and why? And then we're also going to talk about what is changing to drive the new paradigm. So at TALIS, the high-level approach to cybersecurity is defined by nine cybersecurity rules. One of the rules is really important to this audience in this conversation because it speaks directly to penetration testing. Oftentimes, we use a gray box approach with third-party pen testers, and we give them a limited amount of information so they have some understanding about the system components and overall architecture, and they can test all the threat vectors. This is, this is good, and it's a great start considering where we are today, but it also serves as a very good example of a security practice that does not really reach its full potential. The model I just described is performed by a limited number of people for a limited amount of time. We also, they also only have a limited amount of information and it's done in a closed environment that is not really remotely accessible due to policy and other technical limitations today. This approach does not really leverage the full power of the good faith hacking community. And ultimately it results in what can only be called as a a, a limited snapshot into a product's uh, security posture. <clears throat> and we must admit the culture of aerospace and aviation has really kind of contributed to this, this, um, this approach that we have today. <clears throat> Vulnerability management in aerospace and aviation is pretty difficult. Uh, updating the product in most cases is not easy. And, and this is even true for the non-safety critical part of the aircraft. It usually takes a lot of time, a lot of money, and usually a lot of lost revenue to update the system, the aircraft systems. Uh, historically, this has kind of contributed to a closed type of thinking, you know, along the lines of, hey, if, if we don't look hard enough, We'll never find anything, and therefore we must not have a problem. The good news is that this mentality, we're seeing a change of, with this. In a, in a recent Atlantic Council survey, 84% of aviation professionals that were polled indicated that cybersecurity researchers are good for aviation. So now is the time for the industry to improve and we can do better. But first, it's, under, it's important to understand the factors that are driving this shift in, in thinking before we try to answer the question of how we do better. Let's use the cabin of today's commercial aircraft as an example. It makes sense to look here first for a couple of reasons. This portion of the aircraft is not deemed safety critical. Therefore, it lends itself to the fastest changes and is going through a rapid evolution in terms of the technologies and systems deployed to satisfy the airline customer. This means this area of aviation will embrace the good faith hacking community the fastest and with relative ease. And it will likely influence other areas of aviation. So, Everyone knows the majority of commercial aircraft are connected to the internet as Wi-Fi is viewed as critical for today's passenger. There are also several other changes that are, that are bringing the comforts of the living room 
into the cabin in today's passenger. So if we take a look at the in-flight entertainment system, it's a really good example. It's becoming much more complex in several ways. There's an increasing selection of movies and other entertainment content that has not been released to the public. This requires protection and ongoing security testing. There's a large influx of third-party applications and games. And these are games that are not from the Apple App Store or Google Play and have been validated by Apple and Google. These require ongoing security testing as well. E-commerce and shopping options are constantly expanding, along with more convenient ways to pay for your goods and services. And this includes the introduction of technologies like near-field communication. The amount of personal information is increasing, with airlines providing a much more personalized service. With more convenient payment systems, and this also includes the introduction of advertising that is targeted to specific passengers with their demographic information. In order to support all of this, the number of interfaces that on the aircraft that are accessible by the passenger from their seat is increasing. This includes things like USB, Bluetooth, touchscreen, near field communication, and Wi-Fi. Now consider this is only part of the overall equation. All of these solutions I just described to support e-commerce, entertainment, and personalization are supported by a constantly expanding ground infrastructure. In this ground infrastructure, it has similar cybersecurity risks. It's exposed to the same regulatory requirements like PCI and GDPR. But there's a big difference. These environments look and feel much more like a traditional IT environment. So one positive aspect of this is that IT-oriented DevOps teams have already started to embrace practices like crowdsourced pen testing. So in the case of aviation and aerospace, this will be a force that will drive the overall industry towards engaging the good faith hacking community. So before I finish, there's one last thing I'd like to mention about how we are seeing COVID, the COVID pandemic impact this paradigm shift. Third party pen testers who were previously required to be on premise to pen test certain products and solutions cannot travel and be on site to do this, yet the pen testing still must be conducted. So we are seeing companies quickly adopt, adapting, changing their policies and methods to do remote pen testing whenever possible. Obviously this is gonna be a challenge when it comes to systems and products with physical interfaces, but we still see a rapid evolution coming in this area. So COVID is actually knocking down some of the previous barriers when it comes to embracing the good faith hacking community. To summarize, these changes have increased the number of assets that need protection while also increasing the number of threat vectors. At the same time, we see the aviation community's attitude and view on embracing the good faith hacker is changing. This means now is the time to do this. It's time to embrace the good faith hacking community and look at changing the traditional approach to cybersecurity. Now I'll hand it over to Natalie to talk about how we can do this in collaboration with the Good Faith Hacking community. Thank you, Lorenz. You're right. Uh, we need to see more on how to integrate those hacking activities in our engineering and operations. So I, I will use um, the NIST framework, uh, which is what we are following to explain our constraints about that. So when we discuss with Lorenz on, Loren on, on when in this cycle it will be easiest to integrate good face hackers, um, during the identify protect phase, it's more where we do a risk assessment, mm, not uh, the theoretical part, not that easy. Um, but definitely during the, the, the design phase, it's uh, important. And more naturally into the in-service uh, phase. So those two phases, um, the during design phase and in service phase, seems natural to, to me. Today, it's obviously during in service um, that we have already interactions with hackers. 
I will tell a little story about uh, a CV that has been published on the Thales um, cabin product. And uh, we all know that there is room for improvement uh, in this area to render this interaction more fruitful and this dialogue more fruitful between um, industry and hackers. We will discuss that afterwards. Now, I would like definitely to focus on during design phase. Why? Simply because uh, for us, it's where it is the easiest to patch and to remediate. And um, this is also the good place where we can confront the theory of the attack pass that we imagine with the real practice with, the, with hackers and have the good coverage uh, about it. And the most we spend time on cyber robustness, the most we are saving also money, to be honest, uh, in the operational phase and in the in-service phase. So now, when we think about how we can manage this during design phase, it's not easy. Today, I have no example of our airborne system uh, being uh, virtualized uh, and put in a cloud and accessible through a web portal uh, for you to do pen test. Uh, as explained by Lawrence, we are performing our own pen tests directly in, uh, in our labs. So you need to imagine fully representative labs. For example, cabin, you have uh, the, an instance of the economy class, first class, business class, and it's big holes running uh, owned by us, and uh, they are running uh, 24 hours a day and uh, 356 days a year. So you can imagine uh, how it's uh, not easy to, to, to organize a pen test sequence uh, in, such, uh, in such labs which are used to improve our product and answer customer new, new functionalities. So um, to, to be clear, there is also due to the fact we are on special um, technology, if we want to, to get good face hackers working with us, uh, for example, through a bug bounty program, then there is an investment to be done on hacker side because you need to uh, enter into specific technology dedicated for aviation. For example, uh, we don't have uh, Ethernet, we have AFDX, which is ARENC 664. Um, this is uh, Ethernet oriented for safety. And, and there are lots of examples uh, of that uh, on protocols, on operating systems. And uh, this is driven by uh, safety related um, requirements. So when we discuss about uh, Bagunti company on how to, to to organize uh, better interactions with good faith hackers. And they mentioned to us they have already this kind of program for ICT suppliers or, uh, for example, uh, automotive uh, system providers. But with the changing paradigm, as mentioned by, by Lawrence, um, I think that we are no, now moving to virtualized uh, simulation uh, benches and labs or connected. Um, simulation benches of lab and uh, this will help. This is a kind of cyber twin and um, I, I think it's, uh, it's promising. For ground system and ground infrastructure, um, we just need to follow what is a good practice in other sector uh, since they are more uh, IT related and we can easily move to classical uh, bug bounty programs. So to summarize, uh, on how we can work together during the design phase. I think there are two, two tracks we can work on. The first one is dedicated uh, bug bounty programs, uh, where you come to our big halls and, and labs. And uh, the second would be more to develop, and it is more on our shoulder, um, cyber um, twins, which are uh, helping for doing those patents and, and perhaps being more agile doing it more often uh, and uh, with better coverage and not uh, one or two person during uh, uh, some days or week. So, okay, I hope it's clear. Um, now we'll go for the second phase, which is the in-service phase to, to explore what we can do. So here, this is another story. 
And you see the title, we call that managing continuous security. It's not uh, for you, it's uh, for our customer to, uh, for them to understand that uh, security is, uh, is a long road where you need to update regularly due to the fact that new attacks are coming. And uh, in the in-service phase, the, the NIST framework is beginning by the detect. This detection comes to us either through our customer services, uh, which uh, is seeing uh, an incident reported by a customer, or this might be um, an event found uh, on the internet. So, uh, you know, we have a, a threat intelligence team and, and uh, services like that that help us in uh, grabbing kind of videos that may be published by hackers, but also uh, more in standard way, CV that could be uh, published um, on our products. So to, to explain what are the, the issue today, I will give you an example. I think it's the best. Um, uh, it was a, a story that happened to us, I think, uh, last year. And uh, in fact, it was uh, a CV published with a high score of eight which is high specificity, and the, the CVSS is between the one of, of ten, and um, and uh, so uh, it was on uh, in-flight entertainment systems. So first of all, um, I would like to recall that uh, in-flight entertainment system are non-critical uh, system if we consider safety. So this rating is a bit uh, high. And uh, when our incident response team, uh, our PCERT, uh, investigate about that, they learned that in fact it was a vulnerability exploited on a third party chat application. And in fact, uh, the, the, the impact was just uh, you at your seat hacking the chat application, crashing, and not propagating to any other seats, just standalone uh, on the seat. So it was uh, a bit surprising to us that Mitre, even Mitre, has uh, ranked this vulnerability at the level of eight. But finally, we get in touch with a hacker. We had a discussion, and um, we we say that this uh, ACVS score was far too high. And so, when when you when you see such a situation, and we generalize, it's often the case like that. Um, what what is what is the drawback? What are the drawbacks in uh, such a, a way of managing vulnerability disclosure? So today there is no direct notification to our incident response team, product incident response team. So as a consequence, they, they might be very long time, uh, more than two weeks uh, before we get in touch really with the, the, the good face hacker and understand. And uh, also, as uh, this is illustrated here, our sector is not a real, um, really in, understand today. Um, you, you have seen the high rating by, by Mitre. So we need to, to have this kind of uh, education. And hopefully, there are major airlines, and so uh, they are kind enough since they, they are doing their own risk assessment to uh, tune the, the level of patching. But if it wouldn't have been the case in, in, this, uh, in this story we had, um, imagine you, you need to know the exact configuration, product configuration, which aircraft uh, replace the exploit on the exploit, sorry, on our big uh, labs, find the source code, develop the patch, then again test in the big labs. And it's not finished. You need to go to a real aircraft to obtain what is called the field uh, supplier um, acceptance tense, which is provided by the, the airline for them to deploy the patch by ensuring it has no secondary effects on the system. And believe me, um, the best we did for this type of uh, operation uh, was something like uh, three weeks. And uh, even today, there are some patches uh, that we delivered something like more than uh, one year that are not yet deployed by, uh, by some airlines because it's a long process to deploy on all fleet uh, a patch and knowing that some aircraft uh, are under maintenance and things like that. So what I would like to have in the future in a, in a better disclosure program would be the following. First, establishing direct exchange with the, the good face hacker. 
I think it's really important for us to understand and for the hacker to understand also better. Then establishing clear remediation time uh, and steps before going to publication, because depending on, on what is uh, what has been found and what it is impacting, you understand that we don't have the same constraints than in IT world. So we need more time in some cases. So now, if it's better that way, you would say, okay, if I have a vulnerability to disclose, um, what are what are my possibility to uh, today, and how can I interact with us with with you? So this is why um, we have set up first uh, for the whole ecosystem uh, sharing uh, information capacities. When I say the whole ecosystem, I mean uh, airport, airlines, uh, aircraft manufacturers, suppliers. Um, we have very few maintenance operators, but it's uh, it's becoming. It has been set up some the first one uh, more than four years ago. So now, um, what are the one you can use? I, I would advise uh, Aviation Isaac. Aviation Isaac it's an information it's an aviation information sharing um, community, and they are providing support. They have incident response capacity. Uh, to facilitate the interactions between the hacker community and the industry also. Um, so it's, uh, it's a good point uh, for, for you if you need. Now a second one particularly in Europe is EXA. It's European Center for Cybersecurity in Aviation. So they, they don't have an incident response uh, capacity, but last year for DEF CON for aerospace delayed, they were okay, so they set up um, a portal uh, for you to enter the different subjects you would like to discuss and uh, not telling the details, but tell, I don't know, uh, I have something to say uh, about uh, an airport or something to say about uh, a system, airborne system. And, and then they are putting you through um, the good stakeholders that are referenced uh, at Exxon. Which is, uh, which is important uh, also. So I hope it helps and uh, it will be easier for you now. So to, re to recap, on Thales' side, we are definitely considering that with the changing paradigm, we need to set up plans to embed um, good face hackers in our design and operation phase. And to do this with a win-win situation for both sides. To tell you, to be honest, without this COVID uh, crisis, we have scheduled with, with Lawrence to, uh, to come to, um, to DEF CON. Um, what was scheduled is to bring to you a, a mini lab a representative of an in-flight entertainment system, uh, one of our latest uh, generation so that you can have a hands-on exercise on it, and also you can um, learn and try. So now we have done uh, this webinar. This webinar is uh, there to explain what we do, what are our constraints and challenges. And uh, you have heard Yannick uh, telling uh, how the aircraft is, uh, is uh, and is uh, a part of the whole ecosystem and there is not only an aircraft to consider, but all the, the rest of the ecosystems. Lorenz has explained how is the changing paradigm, or the paradigm is changing, particularly uh, post-COVID, with the need of our pen tests to, to be done in a distant way. And I've shared my views on how we are seeing the integration of good face hackers in our design and how to improve the vulnerability disclosure for, for, for you, for us, and for our industry. So I'm sure that good face hacker can be part of the chain of trust in aviation. And um, we need to keep in mind that we are talking about safety critical system. So now I will um, tell you that uh, if we want to get in touch with us, um, we have a, a dedicated address. You can, you can see it on the screen. Uh, 
So it's a sort, I mean, it's product security and citizen's response. So it's really dedicated to, to, to what we are delivering. I hope it helps again. So thank you for your attention. And now I let you the floor for the questions.